We are still working on all the objectives from P7. It doesn't look like a big list. You know, we're solving absolute value inequalities, solving quadratic inequalities. Still working a little bit on that today. Approximate solutions to inequalities. Did a little of that in yesterday's lesson, but we're going to finish that one up today for the objective. And then write and solve problems involving projectile motion. A little rocket science, just a little bit, but it's, it's good stuff. So with quadratics, there can be one solution, there can be no solutions, and there can be infinitely many solutions. And again, we try to write those things in interval notation when we're done and get away from um, the inequalities that we've been using in the past. So it says solve x squared plus 2x plus 2. Hmm. Well, that's a parabola, and the plus 2 means that it should be moving up. But we'd probably graph it on the graphing calculator and see what it looks like. So that's what we'll do. So, keep my glasses on so I can remember what all this was. x squared plus 2x plus 2. I'm going to do zoom 6. That's my negative 10 to 10 window. Most of the time we fit further. Well, look at that. Huh. Okay. So um, just for a sketch, it kind of looks like around negative 1, 1 is where our vertex would be. So right around there. Like that. Wait a second. This said... When is this graph going to be less than zero? Here's zero, right here. It's never going to be below that. So what do we put for set notation that says, hey, there is no answer? And usually the easiest thing to put is, we used to call it the old computer zero. It's called the null set. The null set means the empty set. You can also do the Richard Nixon brackets with nothing in them. But most people prefer to just do the zero with a line through it. So it doesn't. It never goes below the x-axis. And I'll uncover this box here, but your sketch over here is it's good enough. I mean, that's what we needed to see. It's not going to happen. Now, remember, we could know that by algebraically using the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac. b squared minus 4ac for this one will come out to be negative. That means there's no real solution. So there is an algebraic way to know that this isn't going to happen. But the whole point of this problem was to show us that, yes, there can be no solutions. So we would have 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 2, obviously going to be negative. You know, we've got 4 minus 8 here, which means no real solutions, two complex solutions, two imaginary solutions. So it's just kind of a quick double check that you didn't punch it in wrong, you know, when you're looking at it. And then example 6.5 says, hey, let's use the same one. But this time, we're going to change it to greater than 0. When is it greater than 0? Well, when is it above the, well, it's above the x-axis all the time. The whole thing is. So that means this is going to be all real solutions, which in interval notation would be negative infinity to infinity. Now, I do want you to remember that when we're talking about these type of problems, that you're probably not going to see one like this on the test because the test is about the algebra behind what we do. So we want to see the algebra behind how you're finding all of your solutions, whereas these are, are very visual. You might find one um, every once in a while just to we make sure everybody's paying attention, but usually it's the algebra. So can we go through this process of inequalities when... We're not stopping at quadratics when we're doing higher degrees, cubics, quartics, etc., etc. Can they be graphed? Yeah, so we can do them. So if we can factor it, we should. You know, um, there comes a point where we're like, oh my gosh, there's so many terms, I don't know what to do, and that's usually after four terms. Four terms, we try grouping. After that, we're kind of like, well, graphing calculator, I'm going to have to use it. If we can't factor it, we approximate using the graphing calculator. So. Looking at this one, first thought is, 
Hey, let's pull an X out of... Oh, I can't take it out of the negative 1 back there. Well, I'm not going to be able to factor that with an X cubed in the front. No. So we would make a table. And then it's up to you whether or not you're going to use the graphing calculator. Most of the time, it's a good idea when we ask you to graph to do that just to save time. So maybe we'll look at the table from negative 3 to 3. So let's get that bugger in here. And see what it looks like. Oh, we already do have the end behavior of what it looks like by knowing that it's a cubic. So x cubed, x to the third, and I have to get used to the fact that I have to pop that over to get it out of the exponent up there. My old one doesn't do that. And then plus 2x squared minus 1. There it is. Well, the end behavior is obviously what we would have expected for a cubic, starting low, going high. Kind of interested in what's happening there as we approach the x-axis. So let's get some things from the table that we can graph for ourselves. Second graph. And write those down. And I'm going to have to cheat because my can't see them both at once. Negative 3, negative 10. Negative 2, negative 1. Negative 1, 0. 0, negative 1. 1, 2. 2, 15. And I didn't write down the 3. You guys have the 3 where you can see it? Ben, what you seeing? 42? Oh, 44, which I'm obviously not going to graph anyway, but it gives us something to aim for. So our negative 3, negative 10, negative 2, negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 1, 2, and then it goes up from there. So we'd aim at the 2, 15 up here somewhere. Whoops. I'm going to miss that point. Now notice I didn't do the centerpiece because this one's a tough one. I'm not real sure. whether or not that goes above the x-axis there or not. I mean, seeing it, it, it kind of looks like right there. If you look really super duper close, you can see a little bit of the black from the x-axis, which would mean it is going above that. So then one of the things we want to do is we want to investigate just that spot a little bit better. And one of the great things, is, I love this feature, is zoom box. And what that allows you to do is zoom in on, on just a region that you pick. So zoom one. You need to get Blinky in a position that would be the upper left-hand corner of a little rectangle. So I'm going to move Blinky over here because I'm interested in this position. And I'm going to start the upper left-hand corner of my box right there. So I hit Enter. Then I use my down arrow and my right arrow to create a little box. And when I hit enter, it's going to zoom in on that box. Well, look at that. It does go above the x-axis, and that's something that's important to us. We need to know that. So now, since it wasn't factorable, we're going to want to know those coordinates to rounded three decimal places for this spot and the spot right here. So we need to get Pet Blinky again. Second trace, and I'm looking for the zeros. Number two, that's where it crosses the x-axis. The x-intercepts are the zeros. And I'm just moving Blinky over here because Blinky is asking me, am I to the left of that first intersection? 
And now I have Blinky to the left of that intersection because Blinky doesn't know above and below. Blinky only knows left and right. Limited language skills. Hit enter. And then I move my arrow to the right because Blinky is asking me down here at the bottom to be on the right bound of that intersection. Somewhere over there is good. And then Blinky's always playful. Do you want to take a guess? No, Blinky. Find it for me. There it is. So our x value right here would be negative 1.618. So go ahead and write that down as one of those zeros. When I get back to the page, I'll write it down too. Now the other one, we already know where it was. It was in our table. It's negative 1, 0. But if we didn't know, we could do second trace. Number two, if maybe we were in the zone, that happens a lot. You get your brain into thinking you have to do something, and it just sticks. One of the reasons that I'm showing you this is because on the opposite side, the positions of left and right are actually interchanged. It's vice versa. So now we have to be on the left-hand side to be above it and on the right-hand side to be below it. But that's not a shock because that was in our table. So we have our negative 1, 0 and negative um, 6.180. And then I remember there was another spot where it crossed. So I'm going to hit zoom 6 again. And that one was not perfectly at 1, 0. So this is another one where I'm going to need to let Blinky tell me where that 0 is. So I'm at second trace again, number 2. And this time I have it to be below it to be to the left and hit Enter. And then above it to be to the right and hit Enter and enter through guess. And we get 0 0.618, which sounds real familiar because we see it right up there with a negative 1 in front of it. So those are our three zeros, but we want to make sure when we do our graph that we're going just a little bit above the x-axis for this little turning point that we have right here. Find my screen. And I'm going to write those points down again for those people that are watching from home today. Oops. And then make sure it looks like I'm going a little bit above and then coming down. So now I have to think about where my answers are. And I go back to the original, and it said greater than or equal to 0. And here's where that other color comes in handy that I asked you to have. We want to have the pieces that are going to be above the x-axis as our answers. So there's this little bitty piece right here. And there's this piece that goes on forever right here. And then I ask myself, should I include those points that are on the x-axis? What do you think? Should we include them? It has an equals bar, doesn't it? So I'm just going to put kind of a big oversized dot at those points to remind myself, hey, those need to be included. So now I think about how I'm supposed to answer this, and I, I realize I don't think I'm even going to go to an inequality anymore. You know, I, I want to go right to interval notation. And interval notation is so much like the number line. So I think as I'm approaching this graph, my answer starts right here. Where was that again? Oh, yeah, that was right here. Negative 1.618, and I needed to include that. Scroll this up a little. And then, as I'm walking on the number line, I have answers for a little while until I get to that spot right there. And that spot was where x was negative 1. And again, that's included because it did have an equals bar. But there's more. And so in yesterday's notes, we talked about how we have a symbol for that in math. And that symbol is going to be union. Our solutions are here or here is what we're saying. And then I get back on the number line, and I realize no solutions for a while. Oh, there it is. It starts right there. And I have to include that 0 
even though I rounded to get that answer. I have to show people that I understand this had an equals bar, so I do have to include those points as I'm showing that cubic inequality that I'm working with. So yeah, even if it's higher than a quadratic, we can't do a lot with the algebra sometimes because we can't do the factoring for some of this, but we can find it. We can figure out where it is. So good problems on that page, kind of some well, stuff we maybe won't see a whole lot. Again, because there's not a lot of algebra behind it. Now, um, hopefully you're sitting there thinking, when are we going to be able to figure out mathematically how high that little spot goes? I mean, we, we use the calculator for the other stuff, but when will we mathematically be able to figure out where is the maximum right there? That's called a local maximum. And I have bad news. You don't figure that out until you're in calculus. So we are going to use the graphing calculator for certain things this year. Local maxes, local mins, we still have to use the graphing calculator for. But there's a lot of stuff we can do by hand, and that's, that's what we want to work on. So now, rocket science. I love this because it shows people that you're just not that far from doing those kinds of things, you know? Um, Mr. Peterson is back teaching this year. Mr. Peterson actually started off as an aeronautical engineer. I mean, that's, that was his field. But he decided sitting in a cubicle all day wasn't his deal, and so he taught for 30-something years, you know? So we're not that far from all this good stuff. The movement of an object that is propelled vertically, up and down, but then subject only to the force of gravity is an example of projectile motion. So for projectile motion, it says, suppose an object is launched vertically from a point S sub naught, feet above the ground, with an initial velocity of V sub naught, feet per second. The vertical position S in feet of the object T, seconds after it's launched, is, and here's our little formula, S equals negative 16 T squared plus V sub naught T plus S sub naught. Now what's up with these little S sub zeros that I'm saying S sub naught for? Whenever you have a sub zero, a sub naught. That's always telling you before the fuse is lit. You know, what did it look like? Where was it before the fuse was lit? So, V with a sub zero is pronounced V sub naught, and S with a sub zero is pronounced S sub naught. So we get a projectile is launched straight up from the ground level with an initial velocity of 288 feet per second. When will the projectile's height above the ground be 1,152 feet? Oh, well, I don't know. Let's put it in the formula and let's find out. So we go back up and we try to figure out what did all these variables stand for again. And it says S is the vertical position in feet of the object T seconds after it's launched. They want to know when is it going to be 1,152. Now that equals negative 16t squared plus v sub naught was the initial velocity. And in the problem, they told us the initial velocity was 288 feet per second. And then s sub naught is the height when all this started. And they said it was launched from the ground. Ground level would be zero feet high. So now I look at this, and I realize it's a quadratic. And my first go-to with quadratics is always factoring. So I better move everything over to one side and see if I can do that. Looks like so. Now, I don't know about you. But I'm really hoping I can divide negative 16 out of all of this, because that is a monster. So I'm not going to go to the one on the smart board, since this is just using division here. Obviously, we can take negative 16 out of negative 16 t squared. But ooh, that's excellent news. And that's even better news. Yeah, so negative 16 can come out of all of this.
and we will have t squared minus 18t plus 72 to deal with. Okay, so um, pulled out the greatest common monomial factor. It's not a perfect square trinomial because this is not a perfect square back here, but maybe, just maybe, we can do some old-fashioned factoring and come up with two numbers that multiply to 72 and add to negative 18. I'm going to tell you they're usually not the first two that pop into your head. Find them for me, please. Anybody already find them so we can tell everybody else to quit struggling? Yeah, 6 and 12. There it is. So 6 and 12. So that means our solutions would be at 6 seconds and 12 seconds. Now, let me put all this together in my brain visually. So you're telling me the rocket comes up and at 6 seconds it's going to hit 11.52. It's still going up, and then it comes back down, and it hits at 12 seconds. That makes sense. So, you know, just a general sketch over here doesn't have to be fancy. It's to say, we know this is a quadratic that had a negative in front. So, our parabola, going to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, I can't fit. Yeah, I can fit 12. This is a 20 by 20. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I'm just going to make 11.52 right here. Now again, the, the part I don't know is how far up it goes. You know, but this is just a sketch. So we can figure out what's going on with this rocket, this projectile. Well, for the first part, we're done because it said, you know, figure out when this is going to happen. And this, 6 seconds and 12 seconds would be our answer. But there's a follow-up. And the follow-up, way up back up there, says, when will the projectile's height above ground be at least 1,152 feet? That's why I like that sketch, because now it matches up with the things we were doing before, and I'm changing colors here so that I can think, all right, it'll be exactly 1152 right there. Is 1152 at least 1152? It counts, doesn't it? And then these are higher than that, so they're going to count, and we're right back there. So it's between those two positions. That's an and sandwich. But we're not going to use inequalities, which actually makes this a little bit easier because we know where those two spots were. Anything between 6 and 12 seconds, including the 6 and the 12, and we'll have it. Little rocket science. Not much, a little bit, but it's good stuff. It makes you realize, like I said, that you are not that far from starting something in aeronautical engineering. You know, this is, this is the beginning of that. And this is one of those days that I really love because hopefully somebody's like, you know what, that's interesting to me. Maybe I'll do something like that one day. So um, what I want you to do is put everything away except for graphing calculator and pencil. And we're going to take a little formative quiz. Oh, for the people watching at home. It's the same assignment yesterday. So if you're thinking, well, how are you going to mark us um, present for, is it the 29th today? Yesterday. The completing the square worksheet was due yesterday. So if you turn in the completing the square worksheet, then I can mark you present for yesterday. And then this will be how I mark you present for today, you know, from the 30th.